Jesus said, remember the words that I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. According to the world watch list, which is monitored by Open Doors uh, Ministry, who monitors these types of things, it has been found that over the last two years, persecution of the Christian faith has increased. In fact, especially in places like the Middle East, which doesn't surprise us because of all that we see on the news and with the rise of ISIS, and even though that battle continues to go on, uh, still anti-Christian thought and persecution is spreading in the Middle East. But also in Africa, places like Somalia, which we do hear about in the news, but many, many places in the continent of Africa. And then also in Central Asia, and of course, we think of places like North Korea, terrible, terrible persecution, extreme uh, lack of religious freedom. And that's why it's important for us in this country to continue to be mindful of that and to make sure that we don't slip down the path that other countries have allowed themselves to slip down through. Let me give you an example. In Iran, um, the people who are born there ethnically as Persians and referred to them as Persians because of the Persian Empire and just as you study world history. But if you are born as an ethnic Persian in Iran, by definition, you are a, a Muslim. You are considered a Muslim. And so to be an ethnic Persian who comes to faith in Jesus Christ, um, it is a crime, a crime that is punishable by death. Hard to imagine, isn't it? In Saudi Arabia, where once one of the oldest known churches stood and where Christianity used to be allowed to spread, now it is forbidden in Saudi Arab Arabia to publicly worship Christ. In Nigeria, again, this is on average now, but on average in Nigeria, there's an average of five churches that are attacked every week. And yet, in all of these countries and in these places, there are people who deem the cause of Christ and the name of Christ worthy enough that they are willing to endure persecution and suffering because they want others to know that there is a God who loves them and there is a truth and it, the truth is Jesus Christ, revealed in the person and the work of Christ. Over 100 million Christians, and again, this is just taken from what we know about uh, Christians around the world, so it's hard to put an exact number on it, but you know, everybody else uses statistics, and I think it's important for us to get this, but a, a pretty good rough uh, estimation of statistics, there's 100 million Christians in the world today who are being persecuted for their faith simply because they believe there is a person named Jesus and he is the son of God, the creator of the world who gave his life that we might have forgiveness in a relationship with God. Hard to imagine how that can be a crime. Every month, uh, go ahead and put the slide up. Um, this is from opendoorsusa.org, again, that tracks a lot of this information. So again, as best as they can tell from information that's coming in from all these various places and with our connections in the body of Christ, but every month, on average, 322 Christians are killed for their faith. And some of you thought that that only happened back in the New Testament times in the Roman government, right? Nah. More persecution happening now to believers in Christ than ever in history. 214 churches and Christian properties on average are destroyed every month. And 772 acts of violence are committed against Christians. And again, who could know an exact number? But based on what we hear, reports that come in and known uh, incidences, this is a pretty good um, statistic, I think, pretty accurate. Another example, there's a tent maker in Morocco, and uh, he was struggling with the realization after he came to know Christ that if he made his faith known public, 
through water baptism and beginning to talk about his faith, that it would cost him his life, that basically it was a death wish. And he struggled with this because he truly believed and he struggled with what he should do. He came to the conclusion and he said, if Christ isn't worth dying for, then he's not worth living for. Wow. I mean, what a thought. Could any one of us really have that kind of faith? I hope so. And I'm trusting so. Time and again in the New Testament, we are reminded that it's not easy to follow Jesus unreservedly, but it is absolutely worth it. The Apostle Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. We are hard-pressed on every side. Again, I want to take a moment to remind you, the man that is writing this, that has been kept preserved by the Holy Spirit of God for all these centuries, this was written by a man who did not believe in Jesus originally, who persecuted his followers, who wanted to silence the message of Christianity because he was a strong Jewish believer who believed in Yahweh God, believed in the God and had the scriptures that, that even said that God would send a Messiah in the world through the Jewish nation, but it would not only be for the Jewish people, but for all people, but his eyes were blinded to it. And in his Jewishness, and this is not a, this is not a put down of the Jewish faith. I'm just telling you the facts of what happened historically. This man in his Jewish faith was so indoctrinated that he couldn't even see what God was doing right in front of him. And so he wanted to silence Christianity and he wanted to silence Christ. And so he spent his early on part of his life persecuting Christians. And then he had an encounter with the Holy Spirit of Christ, the living Lord. And it rocked his world. It changed his mind. It changed his whole world view. And he realized that Jesus is our creator, the son of God, the savior of the world. And then he devoted his life to, to spreading that message. And because of that, then he himself became persecuted. So this is amazing. But this is what this man writes now. Now, as a believer in Christ, he says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed. It's hard to understand sometimes why God allows things in our life. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. That's the phrase that I pray will stick in your mind today. You may be persecuted, but you are not abandoned in Christ Jesus persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. You know, it really is difficult to understand why God would allow persecution but there are some things as I've thought about it and reflected on what today is and, and just God's work in the world. There, there are some things that, that came to the forefront of my mind of a purpose in persecution. Even though we don't fully understand why God allows it, there are, there are some purposes in it. So based on the teachings of Jesus and the testimony of those who have gone through it, both in the past, but even those who are going through it now... Number one, and really one of the most obvious ones, is persecution tests the genuineness of our faith in Christ. But I believe it also reveals the genuineness of our faith in Christ. The Apostle Paul, again, who persecuted the church, writes this to a young man named Timothy who was following Paul and the ministry of Christ. And he writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, I don't know about you, but even here in America, with the freedoms that we have as a follower of Christ, as I've wanted to more and more take it seriously and honor Christ with my life, when I've taken times to not be preachy, not come across as being better than anyone else, because I'm certainly not, and that's not what it's about, though, you know, often you get those kind of things, and I think that's a, those comments, that's a form of persecution. But sometimes, as Christians, people 
do come off wrong. But the thing is this, when you want to honor Christ with your life, and therefore you don't do certain things that all the rest of the culture does or all the rest of the culture says is cool and you need to do it, and, and you just stand up and say, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it because I want to follow Christ in this way. And what happens? You get made fun of. You get the snide remarks. You get the, oh, you think you're better than us. And, you know, you're being judgmental, all you Christian. You know, you, you just get all that. Well, that's a form of persecution. It's mild, but it's a form of persecution. And we see in the scripture the truth is spoken to us. If you truly want to live a godly life in Christ, then you just may as well expect it because it's going to happen. We will be persecuted. So it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when and how much. And that is universal around the world. Jesus says this, it's recorded in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. What is righteousness? It is simply trying to live rightly, honor God with your life, believing his word is true, and then following it. And so again, your genuineness of what you believe and how you want to live is going to be tested. And he, Jesus says, blessed are you if you're persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's not that you're doing these things to get into heaven. Again, it's an evidence of your faith in him is real. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. That's the key. Because we all have people that will say bad things about us and criticize us. And that's just part of human li uh, humanity and human life. But when these things happen to us simply because we stand for our faith in Christ, now it takes on the tone of persecution. And Jesus says that you will be blessed and rewarded if you're willing to stand up under that for his glory. Because he pays attention. He says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. That is one of the things, along with just wanting to be a witness for Christ, that helps those who are enduring difficult persecution to have the strength to stand because they're trusting in the promise of Christ that great is their reward. In fact, Jesus said, if you deny me before man, mankind or humanity, I'll deny you before the Father. It's not that he's being threatening. He's just talking about the honesty of what we believe. If you truly believe something, then you're going to be willing to stand for it. I shared this earlier, and I talk, when I talk to people about being open with their faith, again, you don't have to be obnoxious with, us, but, but, with it, but just don't be ashamed it's the same way in a marriage relationship. I don't know of anybody over all my years of doing marriage counseling, pre-marriage counseling, doing weddings. I have yet to encounter somebody that said, you know, I have met the love of my life and we want to get married, but we're just going to keep it a secret. And we're not going to tell anybody. So will you do a ceremony for us, but we don't want anybody to be there. Just be us. And then when we get done, we're not ever going to talk about our spouse because we don't want anybody to know. Because, you know, it might offend them that we've made a commitment. I mean, who does that? Nobody does. And we, we're chuckling. I hear it. It's ridiculous. And yet, what do so many do with their faith in Christ? Well, I just, that's between me and God. I just don't talk about that. And so Jesus calls us out on it. And he says, okay, okay, if that's the way you're going to be. If you deny me before mankind, I'll deny you before my father. That's just how this works because I'm calling you out on your fakeness. So if you really believe in something, you're not going to be ashamed of it. And that's what this is saying here. Rejoice and be glad if you stand for Christ and people make fun of you. So what? He is the one who gave his life for you. He created you and he wants you and I to honor him with our life out of gratitude and love. That's it. So persecution tests are genuineness of faith. Uh, the, Peter one of the followers of Christ that did deny him, but later had an opportunity to um, acknowledge him and in fact later was persecuted for his faith. So again, God does give us second chances because Peter denied Jesus, knowing Jesus, but then Jesus came to him and said, do you really love me? Asked him that three times, the same number of times that Peter denied him. And then Jesus said, well, if you love me, then feed my sheep. Come on, let's, let's, let's do this. Honor me with your life. Do what I've created you to do. So God does give us second chances. 
But anyway, Peter writes this, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though it's refined by fire, talking about gold here, here it is, may be proved what? Genuine, authentic. Persecution reveals whether our faith is truly genuine or not. So it may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed, though you have not seen him. I love this because this is written specifically for those of us right here today. Everybody who has lived ever since on this side of Christ's death and resurrection and ascension into heaven, this is written for us. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you do not see Jesus now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Second reason I believe that God allows persecution is it does allow us to have a powerful witness for Christ that we wouldn't otherwise have. This is what the Apostle Paul means when he writes in the passage that I just shared with you a moment ago where he says, we are hard-pressed on every side. We are persecuted but not abandoned. Well, just before that passage, uh, a few verses up before that, it says this beginning in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 4. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. He's saying we've come to realize the truth that there is a God and he has loved us enough and cared enough to enter his creation and he has shown us himself in the face of Christ. When you look at Jesus, you are seeing God. And Christ is God's presence with us. It's why he came into this world to demonstrate his great love for us and so that we might know that he does exist and that he loves us and he calls us into relationship with himself. And the way he does that so to speak, is through the funnel or the person of Jesus Christ. And then Paul writes this in verse 7, but we have this treasure, this awesome great treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Here's the amazing thing. God doesn't take the truth of the gospel and lock it up in a vault in heaven, or he doesn't do it through some super powerful Christian followers he puts the truth of the light of the gospel in these fragile, frail human bodies. These physical bodies that, yeah, they grow and it's amazing, but then they start aging and wrinkling and losing elasticity and sagging. Am I depressing you yet? <laughs> Our brains misfire. I had a misfire this morning in, in the first service, and I'll probably have one before this one ends. There are bodies that they're, they're fragile, they're frail, and yet God entrusts the gospel in these. And that's why, Paul, I love the way he, he calls it these jars of clay. They, they can be broken so easily. And yet in that, in our fragile nature, when we are persecuted, when we are struck down, when we can allow the faith of Christ that's beyond our power to shine through us and we can pray for people that are beating and persecuting us, oh, how the light shines out of these old jars of clay that are broken. And that's the example that Jesus set for us. Jesus said that we're to love our enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And Jesus set the example when he was nailed to the cross, one of the most awesome prayers that he prayed as he was nailed to the cross, he was praying for the very ones who were nailing him there. Father, forgive them. And it wasn't just for those that nailed. It was for all of us who were not believing, not trusting, whatever, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus Christ set the example for us, and he calls us to follow his example. So it gives us, persecution gives us a powerful opportunity to witness for Christ in ways that are more powerful than just talking about Jesus when everything's going great and well and good. But when even the harshest skeptic can see someone who's being beaten and still pray and love in return. And by the way, I want to say this. We see a lot in the news people who want to give their life to end the life of others. In other words, for those radicals of the 
Islam, faith, they are willing to give their life, but it's to destroy life. They're willing to die to take out others. <laughs> Christianity is the opposite. We are willing to give our life for the very ones that would persecute us and put us down. We give our lives to save life. And so that's something that we need to make sure that we stand for. Now, I know that not everyone who is of the Muslim faith or the Islam faith believes that way, but I'm just using that as an extreme example to say that as Christians, Christ calls us to give our life uh, so that other lives might be spared. Third reason, persecution allows us to experience Christ's presence and power in profound ways. Again, Peter writes this. He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. That's powerful. It's saying that if you are persecuted, if someone does persecute you, that is evidence that the spirit of God is resting on you because that is what is bringing about the persecution. Satan and his opposition to everything that is of God and of Christ, when, when the spirit of God is resting on you, it, it can bring out this opposition. So again, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed because it's evident that the spirit of and the glory of God rests on you. It's interesting that all people would have to do for their suffering to end when they're persecuted for Christ is to just simply remain silent, to not confess Christ or to renounce the name of Christ, and then their suffering would end. And yet, in their heart, they know it is the truth. How could they not? How could they deny something that they know is true in their heart? And so we need to make sure, again, what we believe and do we have that kind of faith. True spiritual strength doesn't come from human means, but through Christ's spirit alone. The Apostle Paul writes this in Philippians 3, 8 through 11. He says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, literally garbage or trash. That's the things that this life would give us. In order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. And here he says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. There's an Egyptian believer who again in the culture that this individual was in, knew that to stand for Christ would bring suffering. And he says this, in great suffering, you discover a different Jesus than you do in normal life. Pain and suffering bring up to the surface all the weak points of your personality. In my weakest state, I had an incredible realization that Jesus loved me even right then. So how do people have the courage to endure? Well, it's because they have a helper, and that helper is Jesus. In John chapter 14, the words of Christ are recorded when he was talking to his disciples. This is before he was crucified and before he rose from the dead, before he ascended up into heaven. He was preparing his followers then for what he was going to do next. And I want us to look at this and pay attention. I've got it highlighted in yellow because I want you to, to really focus in on some important things that if you just skim over it and read it quickly, you might miss it. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, this is part of the mystery of the Trinity, triune nature. Here again, you see all three aspects of the triune nature of God mentioned right here in these few verses. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Not three different gods, all one God, but existing eternally in, in these ways. But Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, which literally means one like unto myself. And that word helper is translated into various uh, English translations as advocate, um, counselor. 
And I want to take some time over the next couple of weeks to talk a little bit about all the different ways that Christ helps us through his Holy Spirit. But it's interesting that one of the ways that's translated is helper, and that is an, an accurate description. I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth. Now he gets a little more in detail referring to Holy Spirit. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Now watch this. Look at it carefully. You know him for he dwells with you. Now it'd be easy to say, okay, Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit dwelling with them. But notice he started this out by saying, Holy Spirit's not here yet. I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to send you another like helper like unto me. And then he says, well, you know who this is because he dwells with you. Jesus was dwelling with them right in the moment. Are you, are you tracking with me, or have I lost you? Jesus is, I want you to, and it's going to be real clear here in a minute. So Jesus is saying, you know this guy. I, I really think he was kind of doing that little cheeky thing, you know, like, you know this guy, he dwells with you, and he will be in you. And then they're like, ooh, who is this? And then he clearly says, look at what he says. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. How can you read that any other way other than to say that Jesus Christ is one and the same with God the Father and one and the same with his Holy Spirit? So right now in this place, people say, well, where's Jesus? Show him to me. He is here. Amen. He is here through his Holy Spirit because this is what he said. I'm not going to leave you alone. I will come to you. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to abandon you. You're going to see me ascend and go up into the sky in my human form, but I'm not going to really leave you as orphans. I will come to you, and I'm going to dwell in you. This is how right now, in this place, in this building, we can be worshiping Christ and experiencing his presence, his Holy Spirit presence, literally with us, while people on South Parkersburg and North Parkersburg and Williamstown and throughout the Mid-Ohio Valley who are gathered in churches in the Mid-Ohio Valley are worshiping him right now, and he is right there with them at the same time that he is here with us, and not only here in the Mid-Ohio Valley, but across America, and right now around the world in whatever time zone it is, Christ is present. He, is, he can be everywhere all at the same time. When he came here in human form, he was in one place at one time, even though in his, again, this mystery of the triune nature, he still was omnipresent. But now that Christ has ascended back to the Father and his spirit has come into the world, Jesus can be everywhere all at once. And he invites us to open our heart and life to him. That's why even though we're worshiping him corporately here in this place, you can also worship him very personally and very intimately, just you and him. This is the amazing thing that he offers, and this is how people can endure suffering and persecution. So there's two excellent ministries that help us to know uh, what to do and how to help those who are persecuted. Those ministries are Voice of the Martyrs and Open Doors. And so what I'm going to do just to close this out, because even though today is international day of prayer for the persecuted church. What I don't want to do is we have a moment of prayer today. We all feel good because, oh, look, we honored the persecuted. We had a little prayer at church. Sorry to sound condescending, but we had a little prayer at church for the persecuted. Now we've done our duty. I feel really good about myself. Let's go eat and let's go watch the ball games this afternoon. And in the meantime, these people are still being beaten and tortured and families torn apart simply because they won't deny Jesus. So what I don't want to happen is for us to say a prayer here and think it in. So my hope is, and my prayer, and what I felt led to do is to share this with you today and to give you some resources so that as this week unfolds, I'm hoping and trusting the Holy Spirit's going to touch your life and Jesus will remind you and you'll pray this week for people who are being persecuted. So... Um, in fact, the scripture tells us, go ahead and put the next scripture up. I think it's Hebrews 13, 3. Uh, remind or remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. This passage of scripture is just as important for us as all those that tell us to believe in Jesus and to live out our faith. I have to confess I've been guilty of not following this as often as I should. 
And we are called, they are part of our family. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. No matter what their skin color, their ethnicity, in Christ we're one. Amen? We're family. Christ brings us together. So we need to pray for them. We need to support them. And you know what? The number one thing that people are going through persecution ask for, and this is from people who minister and have contact with them. The number one thing they ask for is not for finances, not for deliverance. I mean, they want deliverance. Don't get me wrong. But the number one thing they ask for is that people remember them in prayer. They ask for people to pray for them. So how could we not pray? The Apostle Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 11. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. So today, again, this is to raise awareness in the body of Christ because we don't want you to be uninformed about the suffering that other people are going through. And this is what the Apostle Paul was doing in the early church. He was writing to a church in Corinth. And he says, look, we, we want you to know what's going on. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. And then look at this awesome statement. As you help us by your... Isn't that awesome? If prayer didn't make a difference, why would Jesus tell us to pray? If prayer didn't make a difference, why would the Apostle Paul write this? He says your prayers absolutely make a difference. And the biggest way you can help us when we're going through suffering and hardship is to pray for us. It's a mystery. Can't understand it. Can't explain it. But I know it to be true. I have felt the power of prayer in my life, not when I've been praying always. Yes, sometimes when I've been praying. But you know, when I felt the power of prayer was on the days when I couldn't even pray for myself because I was going through such a rough time. And somehow in my spirit, I can't explain it. I knew there was people praying for me because I felt a sense of strength rise up within me. And endurance, and, and I just, and, and I believe this is part of the mystery of the Holy Spirit. It was as if God was letting me know in that moment, Mark, you're not forgotten. People are praying for you today. And it just strengthened me in my inmost being. This is what the persecuted church wants. So please, let's honor Christ and honor them to pray for them. And again, not just today, but as the Lord leads. So in closing, real quick, I know it's a little bit different kind of a message today. Your response really is going to matter with what you do later this week. I'm going to go straight to the websites now, if you would. So you can do this on your mobile devices, your laptops, whatever, your computers. But put on theirshoes.com. If you want to jot this down, or look, this will be posted uh, on our website, you know, as far as the sermon that is. So if you want to fast forward through the sermon, get to this. These are all websites that are offshoots of Open Doors Ministry. Put on their shoes.com. When you go there, you're going to see this image, and there's three different people. Their names have been changed to protect them. But what's really cool about this is you click on each person, and then what it'll do is it'll give you options like, what's your typical day like? How does it start out here in America? And then it'll show you what their typical day starts out, where they're at under persecution. And it really makes you think. And then it also can help you to pray in a more effective way, I believe, for individuals. So that's a really cool thing. Put on their shoes.com. Go ahead and put the next one up. Another one is persecutedinfo.com. For those of you that like to get on Facebook and like to share things, these are memes, which are basically just internet messages that can be spread uh, through social media or whatever. And these are really well designed. You can see each one is separate. If you go to persecutedinfo.com, you can select whatever one you want, copy it, and put it in your Facebook page and, and, or your social media and share it with people. And it's just to raise awareness for people that are being persecuted for their faith. And just as the Lord leads you, which one do you connect with and what would you like to share for, so that others might pray for people in other parts of the world? Next one. Prayforthepersecuted.com. This one also is really cool. If you go to this website or web page, all it'll have at the top is numbers 1 through 30, and it's encouraging each day you can click on a different number. So it doesn't, if you want to start like 
December 1st, that's fine, but you could start today or tomorrow and just click one. And on day one, it's going to give you suggestions of things to pray for. And so this is right off the website. Day one is to pray for people in North Korea right now because they are going through a terrible time. Christians, I mean, it is bad, real bad. They are being tortured. They're being put in work camps. This isn't something that happened back, you know, during World War I or World War II. This is happening today in the world in North Korea. And by the way, North Korea is an atheist nation. So if you really want America to, you know, not be religious and go to atheism, take a look at North Korea. That, that could be the road we head on. Okay, don't get me started. Um, well, I guess I got me started. <laughs> Perse so anyway, each day, click on it, different prayer. And then the last one is persecution.com. This is where if you, if you were touched and moved by the video clip that you saw at the beginning, you can download that. Pastor Eric shared this with me about a week and a half ago. And thank you, Pastor Eric, for doing that. I know the Holy Spirit worked through him. And that's what inspired me to share this today with you. So um, if you want to, you can request a free DVD. There's a movie coming out next year about uh, Pastor Vermbrand. Um, and again, he wrote the book, Tortured for Christ. It just helps us to get a glimpse into what other people go through for their faith. So thank you for listening to all of that. It, go ahead and put the review up. So here again, there's uh, the different websites. And as always with Google or any of the search engines, if you just type in Open Doors Ministry or Voice of the Martyrs, it'll eventually get you to these particular web pages. So I hope that these will be some things that you will take advantage of. Now, here's how we're going to close the, the, our time together today, and I appreciate your attention. We want to close the service out today by acknowledging some people in the life of Porterfield who God has, uh, he gives us all compassion to some level, and he calls us all to care. But for some, he really puts a special calling on their life. And that is being uh, shown through the Stephen Ministries here at Porterfield Baptist Church. And so today, what we're going to do to close our service out is we have some individuals who have gone through 50 hours of training. We already have one class of Stephen Ministers who are currently serving in the body of Christ here to come alongside someone who's going through a difficult time, a time of suffering or uh, surgery or uh, whatever the problem is, problems at work or with family. They are just people who are going to come alongside and pray for you and support you to be the, the hands, feet, voice, ears of Jesus to you. Uh, men with men, women with women, all done in confidentiality and respect and dignity, but just genuinely wanting to help. And they've, they've devoted 50 hours of their time so that they can do this well with you. So they've gone through the training. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, as I call your names, go ahead and come on up. Uh, actually, come on up to the stage if you wouldn't mind. So first of all, we have Don Azar, if you'll come up. And I've uh, got certificates here for each of you. And also, by the way, they have um, signed a covenant with the church that they are committing to a two-year period to offer their ministry and their services. Lindsay Hoyt, if you'll come on up. Scott Newland, Rex Nickerson, Kathy Parsons, Donna Richardson, Brenda Wilson, and Jennifer Young. And then I'm also going to ask now if our other Stephen leaders who went through training so that they could do training, and then any other Stephen ministers that are present, if you want to come up on either side. And... Um, What we're going to do to close the service out is I'm going to have a charge to these as Stephen ministers, then a, star, a charge for you as a congregation. We're going to have a commissioning prayer. And uh, then after that, I realize we're running just a little long today. I try to, every, every Sunday we go through this, I want to be sensitive to the window of time we have and your time that you commit to be here. But I also want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit leading. And uh, so please keep praying for us as leaders. I'm just being very transparent and candid with you right now. Um, this is not about pleasing people. Um, we all have our different ideas of how church ought to be and, and whatnot. 
And I hope that God has used this message today to just challenge you with some of the things that maybe you've been griping and complaining about or don't li uh, like. And in view of persecution, you ought to be thanking God that you're living in a place that if that's all you got to complain about, that's all you got to complain about. So anyway, here I go. I'm going to get on a soapbox. But I, I say this sincerely. We, we want to be sensitive to your time window of being here. But this is about serving Jesus. And we're doing the best we can to try to communicate. Because if we're not here to worship God and put him first and honor what God is doing in our life, then what are we doing here? So we're wasting our time. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have this commissioning prayer. And for those of you that need to go because you've got commitment, that's fine. No, no condemnation. But then after the prayer, if you want to be dismissed, fine. And the praise band has prepared a song. So if they want to come up and you feel led to stay, just let the Holy Spirit lead. And let's not be critical one way or another, okay? Are we all good? You're not going to tell me if you're not, are you? <laughs> well, Lord, I'm going to trust that you're going to make it okay. So to, this, to the Stephen ministers, and I'm sorry I have my back to you. I'm going to come down here. Are you prepared now to nurture the skills that you have learned and to use them in service to others to support, encourage, and build up and comfort people in all their needs? If so, answer yes with the help of God. All right, and now, congregation, for those of you who are able, stand. If you're not able to stand, it's okay. But if you're able to stand, would you stand for a moment? And now I want to ask you, as members and friends of Porterfield, to open your hearts to the ministry of these people and to pray for them. And by the way, one of the things that I've asked the Stephen ministers to be willing to do, and they are, is at the close of the service, after we dismiss, if there's anybody that has something they would like prayer for, I've asked some of those Stephen ministers to be available so that you can have someone to come and to pray with you. I believe that's so important in the life of the church. We do pray. We're praying church. But this gives you a moment before you walk out the doors to, to have someone pray with you. So... Are you willing to accept them in their ministry to pray for them that they might be effective servants of Christ? We also ask you to accept this ministry when you need help to allow these individuals to work with you as you face struggles in your life, that you might receive support and help from your Christian brothers and sisters who have experienced similar situations. Are you prepared to meet this request? If so, answer yes with the help of God. And then finally, to you as our Stephen ministry class, are you willing to give of yourselves in this ministry, keeping confidentiality, uh, trusting Christ's Holy Spirit leading, and uh, his wisdom and his strength as you minister in this way? If so, answer yes with the help of God. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to a conclusion of uh, our time together in this room, I thank you for your Holy Spirit presence. I just trust, Lord, that you've taken all of our efforts today, those of our praise team, AVL, uh, the Sunday school teachers, nursery workers, Lord, everybody that's working throughout this building. We're here because we have acknowledged that you love us and you've given your life for us. And we're imperfect people, but Lord, as best we can, we want to serve you. We want to use the gifts you've given us and the personalities you've given us to serve you and to honor you with our life. So forgive us, Lord, when we failed to do that. But thank you for your never-ending grace and mercy. And thank you for second chances. And Lord, as I pray for these Stephen ministers now, I thank you for the second chances and third chances that you've given them in life. And Lord, they now are embracing this ministry. They want to share what they have learned. And they want to share the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit dwelling in them to come alongside others. So help us as a congregation to receive this ministry, to embrace it, to be thankful for it. And then, Lord, uh, I pray that you will empower these Stephen ministers, fill them with your Holy Spirit and wisdom and discernment, that uh, each one that they come alongside of and pray for and support and encourage will be a great blessing in the lives of those that they minister to. And help each of us, Lord, to be more and more aware of how you want to use each of us uniquely with the way you created us. Thank you again for your forgiveness and grace, for the presence of your Holy Spirit and your empowerment. And help us, Lord, to be willing to always stand for you, no matter what the world may bring against us. Give us the strength 
of your Holy Spirit that we might endure, learn from those who have gone through persecution, follow their example and the good faith that you have called us to by your power and might in your name, Lord Jesus. We pray and ask this and give you praise. Amen. 